Good day to you all, and welcome to this eighth day of March. It is day 67 in our journey through the Bible. Hello to everyone out there. My name is Hunter. I am your brother, your Bible reading coach, someone who shows up with you every day to spend some time together in the pages of the Bible. And we're going to let the Bible do what the Bible does and direct our hearts to the one who is the living Word of God. We come to Jesus because he first came to us and included us in the life that he shares with the Father and the Spirit. That's right, my friend, you are included. (laughs) And that is good news. Today we are in the book of Deuteronomy, chapters 7 through 9, and we'll finish our reading in Mark's Gospel, chapter 15. Father, thank you. Help us to see. Deuteronomy 7. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are about to enter and occupy, he will clear away many nations ahead of you. The Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. These seven nations are greater and more numerous than you. When the Lord your God hands these nations over to you and you conquer them, You must completely destroy them, make no treaties with them, and show them no mercy. You must not intermarry with them. Do not let your daughters and sons marry their sons and daughters, for they will lead your children away from me to worship other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will burn against you, and he will quickly destroy you. This is what you must do. You must break down their pagan altars and shatter their sacred pillars, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols. For you are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. Of all the people on earth, the Lord your God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. The Lord did not set his heart on you and choose you because you were more numerous than the other nations, for you were the smallest of all the nations. Rather, it was simple that the Lord loves you, and he was keeping the oath he had sworn to your ancestors. That is why the Lord rescued you with such a strong hand, from your slavery and from the oppressive hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commands. But he does not hesitate to punish and destroy those who reject him. Therefore, you must obey all these commands, decrees, and regulations I am giving you today. If you listen to these regulations and faithfully obey them, the Lord your God will keep his covenant of unfailing love with you, as he promised with an oath to your ancestors. He will love you and bless you, and he will give you many children. He will give fertility to your land and your animals. When you arrive in the land he swore to give your ancestors— You will have large harvests of grain and wine and olive oil and great herds of cattle, sheep, and goats. You will be blessed above all the nations of the earth. None of your men or women will be childless, and all your livestock will bear young. And the Lord will protect you from all sickness. He will not let you suffer from the terrible diseases you knew in Egypt, but he will inflict them on all your enemies. You must destroy all the nations the Lord your God hands over to you. Show them no mercy and do not worship their gods, or they will trap you. Perhaps you will think to yourselves, how can we ever conquer these nations that are so much more powerful than we are? But don't be afraid of them. Just remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all the land of Egypt. Remember the great tares the Lord your God sent against them. You saw it with your own eyes. And remember the miraculous signs and wonders and the strong hand and the powerful arm with which he brought you out of Egypt. The Lord your God will use this same power against all the people you fear. And then the Lord your God will send Ter to drive out the few survivors still hiding from you. No, do not be afraid of those nations, for the Lord your God is among you, and he is a great and awesome God. The Lord your God will drive those nations out ahead of you, little by little. You will not clear them all away at once, otherwise the wild animals would multiply too quickly for you, but the Lord your God will hand them over to you. He will throw them into complete confusion until they are destroyed. He will put their kings in your power, and you will erase their names from the face of the earth. No one will be able to stand against you, and you will destroy them all. You must burn their idols in fire, and you must not covet the silver or gold that covers them. You must not take it, or it will become a trap to you, for it is detestable to the Lord your God. 
Do not bring any detestable objects into your home, for then you will be destroyed just like them. You must utterly detest such things, for they are set apart for destruction. Deuteronomy 8 Be careful to obey all the commands I am giving you today. Then you will live and multiply, and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these forty years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character, and to find out whether or not you would obey His commands. Yes, He humbled you by letting you go hungry, and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. For all these forty years, your clothes didn't wear out, and your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for his own good. So obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land of flowing streams and pools of water with fountains and springs that gush out in the valleys and hills. It is a land of wheat and barley, of grapevines, fig trees and pomegranates, of olive oil and honey. It is a land where food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. It is a land where iron is as common as stone and copper is abundant in the hills. When you have eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. But that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey His commands, regulations, and decrees that I am giving you today. For when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God, who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. Do not forget that he led you through the great and terrifying wilderness and its poisonous snakes and scorpions, where it is so hot and dry. He gave you water from the rock. He fed you with manna in the wilderness, a food unknown to your ancestors. He did this to humble you and test you for your own good. He did all this... So you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. But I assure you of this. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods, worshiping and bowing down to them, you will certainly be destroyed, just as the Lord has destroyed other nations in your path. You also will be destroyed if you refuse to obey the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 9 Listen, O Israel. Today you are about to cross the Jordan River to take over the land belonging to the nations much greater and more powerful than you. They live in cities with walls that reach to the sky. The people are strong and tall, descendants of the famous Anakite giants. You've heard the saying, Who can stand up to the Anakites? But recognize today that the Lord your God is the one who will cross over ahead of you like a devouring fire to destroy them. He will subdue them so that you will quickly conquer them and drive them out, just as the Lord has promised. After the Lord your God has done this for you, don't say in your hearts, The Lord has given us this land because we are such good people. No, it is because of the wickedness of other nations that he is pushing them out of your way. It is not because you are so good or have such integrity that you're about to occupy their land. The Lord your God will drive these nations out ahead of you only because of their wickedness and to fulfill the oath he swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You must recognize that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land because you are good, for you are not. You are a stubborn people. Remember and never forget how angry you made the Lord your God in the wilderness From the day you left Egypt until now, you have been constantly rebelling against him. Even at Mount Sinai, you made the Lord so angry, he was ready to destroy you. This happened when I was on the mountain receiving the tablets of stone inscribed with the words of the covenant that the Lord had made with you. I was there for forty days and forty nights, and all that time I ate no food and drank no water. The Lord gave me the two tablets on which God had written with his own finger all the words he had spoken to you from the heart of the fire— when you were assembled at the mountain. At the end of the forty days and nights, the Lord handed me the two stone tablets inscribed with the words of the covenant. Then the Lord said to me, 
Get up, go down immediately, for the people you brought out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. How quickly they have turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They have melted gold and made an idol for themselves. The Lord also said to me, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Leave me alone so I may destroy them and erase their name from under heaven. Then I will make a mighty nation of your descendants, a nation larger and more powerful than they are. So while the mountain was blazing with fire, I turned and came down, holding in my hands the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant. There below me I could see that you had sinned against the Lord your God. You had melted gold and made a calf idol for yourselves. How quickly you have turned away from the path the Lord had commanded you to follow. So I took the stone tablets and threw them to the ground, smashing them before your eyes. Then as before, I threw myself down before the Lord for forty days and nights. I ate no bread and drank no water because of the great sin you had committed by doing what the Lord hated, provoking him to anger. I feared that the furious anger of the Lord, which turned him against you, would drive him to destroy you. But again he listened to me. The Lord was so angry with Aaron that he wanted to destroy him too. But I prayed for Aaron, and the Lord spared him. I took your sin, the calf you had made, and I melted it down in the fire and ground it into fine dust. Then I threw the dust into the stream that flows down the mountain. You also made the Lord angry at Tabarah, Massah, and Kibroth HaTavah, and at Kadesh Barnea. The Lord sent you out with this command, Go up and take over the land I have given you. But you rebelled against the command of the Lord your God and refused to put your trust in him or obey him. Yes, you have been rebelling against the Lord as long as I have known you. That is why I threw myself down before the Lord for forty days and nights, for the Lord said he would destroy you. I prayed to the Lord, and I said, O sovereign Lord, do not destroy them. They are your own people. They are your special possession, whom you redeemed from Egypt. By your mighty power and your strong hand, please overlook the stubbornness and the awful sin of these people. And remember instead your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you destroy these people, the Egyptians will say, The Israelites died because the Lord wasn't able to bring them to the land he had promised to give them. Or they might say, He destroyed them because he hated them. He deliberately took them into the wilderness to slaughter them. But they are your people, and your special possession whom you brought out of Egypt by your great strength and powerful arm. Mark 15 Very early in the morning, the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of religious law, the entire high council, met to discuss the next step. They bound Jesus, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, You have said it. Then the leading priest kept accusing him of many crimes, and Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer them? What about all these charges they are bringing against you? But Jesus said nothing, much to Pilate's surprise. It was the governor's custom each year, during the Passover celebration, to release one prisoner, anyone the people requested. One of the prisoners at that time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. The crowd went to Pilate and asked him to release a prisoner as usual. Would you like me to release to you this king of the Jews? Pilate asked, for he realized by now that the leading priest had arrested Jesus out of envy. But at this point, the leading priest stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. Pilate asked them, Then what should I do with this man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back. Crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder. Crucify him. So to pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. The soldiers took Jesus into the courtyard of the governor's headquarters, called the Praetorium, and called out the entire regiment. They dressed him in a purple robe, and they wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. Then they saluted him and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him on the head with their reed stick and spit on him and dropped to their knees in mock worship. 
when they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. A passenger nearby, Simon, who was from Cyrene, was coming in from the countryside just then, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. And they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. They offered him wine drugged with myrrh, and he refused it. Then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. They divided his clothes and threw dice to decide who would get each piece. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. A sign announced the charge against him. It read, The King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and the other on his left. The people passed by shouting abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Ha! Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you're going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, save yourself and come down from the cross. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross so we can see it and believe him. Even the men who were crucified with Jesus ridiculed him. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. Then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he could drink. Wait, he said. Let's see whether Elijah comes to take him down. Then Jesus uttered another loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he had died, he exclaimed, This man truly was the Son of God. Some women were there, watching from a distance, including Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph, and Salome. They had been followers of Jesus and had cared for him while he was in Galilee. Many other women who had come to him from Jerusalem were also there. This all happened on Friday, the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath. As evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea took a risk and went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Joseph was an honored member of the High Council and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. Pilate couldn't believe that Jesus had already died, so he called for a Roman officer and asked if he had died yet. The officer confirmed that Jesus was dead, so Pilate told Joseph he could have the body. Joseph bought a long sheet of linen cloth. Then he took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped it in the cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been carved out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone in front of the entrance, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where Jesus' body was laid. And now may our Lord give his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Amen. They were rebellious. They worshipped other gods, even after God had rescued them from Egypt. After all that, they would still reject him. Like all people everywhere, we reject God. But God doesn't reject us. I know it sounds like this, like God is wanting to reject them, to do away with them in these passages we've read today. And God knows that's how we often feel, don't we? That God has rejected us, that he despises us, that he wants to judge us. And no doubt this is what Moses believes to be true about the heart of God. But God's heart is not fully known to Moses yet. He, like we, are seeing things through a glass darkly. But one day he will see fully. One day he will fully know the heart of God. The day that he sees Jesus face to face. The day that he sees the Son of God offering himself on behalf of all rebellious humanity on another mountain on Mount Moriah on a cross. There in the Christological light of eternity, the true heart of God is being seen by Moses, and the heart he sees far exceeds what Moses could even think or imagine. Moses 
had to plead over and over again for these people. Over and over again, he falls face down to the ground and pleads time and time again that God would be merciful. And God was merciful. God's mercy was not because these people had somehow merited mercy, but because God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he would find a way to rescue them, to bless them, to make them his own. And his plan was not just for them, but for all people. Mark 15 shows us exactly how God's going to do that by offering himself, by pouring out his self-giving, sacrificial love on the cross, taking punishment on our behalf, ransoming us from sin, death, and the grave. He's doing something about rebel-hearted people there on that cross. He's forgiving them, shedding his blood for them embracing them. He's rescuing them from their delusion. He has not come to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Someone greater than Moses is our advocate now. Jesus is the greater advocate. Jesus is undoing what Adam did. The vicarious life of Christ was not just for the descendants of Abraham. This was for all humanity. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Jesus is a better Moses. (laughs) And he has come to reveal the Father's heart to the world. And to make a way for us to enter in and to occupy not the land, but life in him. So let us enter in by faith. God's good heart has been revealed, and you are his. The prayer of my own heart today is that that I will know it deep down in my bones, that I will see face to face the one who is greater, my advocate, Jesus. And that's the prayer that I have for my family, for my wife, my daughters, and my son. And that's the prayer that I have for you. May it be so. Well, hey, hey, friends. If you haven't signed up to our Facebook page, you might want to do it. Every day, Heather has been posting excerpts from her book, Discovering Jesus, A Journey Through Lent. So if you didn't get the ebook for whatever reason... Well, you can just read the post each day on our Facebook page. It's also a great way to stay in the know with the DRB and all that's going on here. And before I let you go, just want to remind you that there is a couple of seats left with our upcoming trip to the Holy Land in September, September 5 through 15 to be exact. And we would love for you to get on that bus. So head on over to the webpage. Click on the Israel 2023 tab and learn all about it. Sign up and register and get that seat while it's still there. And while you're at it, invite a friend. Well, hey, friend, what do you say we all show up again here tomorrow? And we'll do it again. That's my plan. Until that time, let's do a couple of things. Maybe let's get out and take a walk today. Let's breathe deep, look up, and say thank you to the one in whom you live and breathe and have your very life. To our Lord Jesus, let's cultivate thankful hearts. Let's go forward in God's joy and let's always remember this, that you are loved. No doubt about it. All righty, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care.